you have a tutorial on JavaScript coercion. Why does that have such a bad reputation? It has a terrible reputation because I think, unfortunately, our industry has kind of been trained, and it's not really entirely our fault, but we've been trained through the various ways that books have been presented, lots of conference talks, blogs, things like that. We've been taught that what our industry values the most is rapid development, quickly moving from feature to feature, and that's how we you know, advance in our jobs and things, but there isn't a lot of emphasis on truly deeply learning things. So if something's not easily accessible right at hand, we sort of skip over it or look for a framework or some tool to cover that thing up. Coercion is one of those areas where it pays off if you learn it, but a lot of people haven't ever needed to. And, be, and I like to tell people that basically anything that you don't learn is indistinguishable from magic, that old Arthur C. Clarke quote. I mean, it, if you don't learn it, it is really difficult to understand. And so I'm trying to inspire people to learn that part of JavaScript just like they learn any other part of the language. Where does the mischaracterization come from? Is it, is it tied to some larger perspectives on JavaScript? I, I definitely think so. There, there are an awful lot of people that write JavaScript that haven't either, either haven't given a, a lot of thought to the design philosophies behind the language, or they've simply followed the cult myth that JavaScript was poorly designed. Mm -hmm. And they, it's almost like they're bearing this burden, oh, every day I have to write this awfully designed language. Yeah. And I think for those of us that spend a lot of time with the language really learning it, we see a different aspect to the language. We see an, a language that has a lot of internal consistency, but it's not immediately observable. And I think that mischaracterization comes, again, from if you glance at the language, if you see something where a piece of code didn't work exactly the way you expected it to work, you think, well, there must have been something wrong in the design, almost as if a language is supposed to know what you're thinking before you write it. I prefer to focus more on the craft, understanding exactly how to use those tools, using a hammer for a hammer's job, a screwdriver for a screwdriver's job, to be metaphorical. I think that's a much better and more effective way of learning the language, but it does require more of people than I think a lot of people are maybe necessarily used to. What initially drew, uh, drew you to JavaScript? I actually you know, was kind of a full stack developer back in the early 2000s, so I did a lot in the LAMP stack with PHP. And of course, in that sort of development, they sort of require you to know at least some degree of how to, how to present an interface with JavaScript. And so I kind of fell into getting more into JavaScript because as I would write code in the back end with something like PHP and then I'd duplicate that code in JavaScript in the front end, I actually found, contrary to a lot of people's uh, experiences, I found that JavaScript was more natural mm -hmm. to the way I wanted to express myself in code and I struggled more with the back end than the front. So I gravitated over those years towards more and more of the front end, eventually sort of exclusively saying when I take a job I want it to be specifically JavaScript. And maybe about three or four years ago when I went independent, that's when I decided instead of just writing code for a living, I want to actually get into teaching code for a living. And that is really where I ramped up because I realized just how much I didn't know about the language and how much I needed to focus on uh, digging into it. Where do you see JavaScript going in the near term, maybe the next two to three years? I think the biggest shift that we're seeing in JavaScript is that it is moving simultaneously in two directions. It's moving more to the authorability side. So a lot of the things that we see in ES6, aka ES 2015, uh, the newest version of JavaScript that's landing now has an awful lot of features in it that are designed to be uh, allow you to express yourself much more clearly than you've ever had been able to do before. It's not necessarily a new feature that you haven't been able to do, but definitely a new way of expressing it more readably than ever before. Uh, so there's that directional shift, trying to allow people to write better code so that we can all learn from each other, we can all maintain code better. There's another shift to JavaScript, which is being stretched by other uses for the language. Other languages, for example, like the closure scripts and the type scripts and the coffee scripts that don't, you don't author in JavaScript, but you author in some other language and you compile to JavaScript. JavaScript is being stretched in that way to provide more and more features that can make optimal performance for those transpiled languages. So we see the language kind of being pulled in both directions. And rather than that being a bad thing, I think it's a good thing. I think it's forcing some evolution that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise. What is the biggest web or code problem that you're running into right now? Actually, I think the biggest problem that the web has right now is that I think it's primarily being built by a group of people that feel, and I, it's not a specific group, but a group of people in the general sense that take for granted things like unlimited and free bandwidth. 
when I travel around the world and I'm on metered bandwidth that I'm paying dollars per kilobyte to load pages, and I go to a website that has lots of fancy fonts and lots of great high-res retina sorts of images on them, the experience isn't what is supposed to be such a great experience. We're supposed to be using these tools to provide great experiences, but unfortunately, it's the slow loading times, and I often have to choose not to visit a site because there's no way to visit it without paying 20 or $30 worth of bandwidth to, to, to get to. So I think what, we, what we've done is we've sort of become drunk on the features that we have available to us and taken for granted that everyone has a super fast mobile device or laptop, that everyone has unlimited bandwidth, and that it's free to them. I think we need to begin to take a step back and look at the web more in layers. We need to provide the basic functionality, sort of. My anecdote for this is, is the Gmail experience, the Gmail web client. They have a link at the bottom that says, load just the basic HTML. And I don't know how many people click on that, but that's the sort of thing, if I was on a site, I'd like the option, either through the browser settings or through the application itself, I'd like the option of saying, just the facts, ma'am, just give me the basic stuff so that I can get the meat of this content without necessarily having to choose not to visit your site because of your retina images, for example. I think that's really important to, to making this spread. We see companies like Mozilla moving to provide low cost um, but still high powered devices in, in third world countries and other parts of the world that haven't had the kind of access that we do necessarily like here in the States. And I think that's great, but I think if we don't build the web for those devices, they're still going to be disenfranchised, they're still going to be left out. So we need to rethink how we as crafters build the web to make it more accessible to them. Related to that, what was the issue five years ago that you were confronting and how was that solved if it was? Well, the issue five years ago, I think, clearly was we started to see this move towards mobile devices. 2007 was clearly, you know, the iPhone launched and everybody got excited about this idea that now we have mobile computers. It certainly wasn't the first mobile phone, but it was the first widespread adoption of this mindset. The web needs to move into the mobile space. And so we saw people designing sites specifically so that it looked great on that exact iPhone. Well, it was a year or two later when another iPhone with a slightly different screen size came out, and then another phone with a slightly different screen size, and then we saw tablets. And so five years ago, we really didn't have a, a grasp on this mindset that the web needs to adapt to the environments that it's in. And now we do understand that the web needs to adapt to the screen sizes. We have this whole movement of responsive design and all of the technologies that feed into making a web application, whether that's JavaScript, CSS, the markup, whatever, plus all the tool systems in the ecosystem on top of that. All of them adjusted to support that sort of mindset. I think the next step, the thing that we haven't really solved, is that we're not adapting really to the environment of the device. For example, its bandwidth, for example, how much it costs somebody to do something. We aren't adapting to those things yet, but at least we've taken a big step towards adapting to the screen size where it's no longer a prevalent mindset that someone designs something and, and, and wants it to look pixel perfect on every device. We know that that's not even real anymore. So the next step, the next step of that evolution, the next logical step is to start saying features don't have to show up if they're too expensive for someone to use and designing those things in layers. Last question for you. What people or projects are you following these days? I follow an awful lot, given that I'm you know, writing on this book series about JavaScript, I follow an awful lot of the JavaScript community, so I'm following the people that are on the TC39 committee, and that's kind of, what, kind of what gets a lot of my focus these days, is every little nuance, every time I see a tweet from someone on the committee that talks about a little nuance of the language, I'm hyper-focused on those sorts of things. But that's just a wave of time at the moment. That just happens to be what has got all of my attention. Great. Well, thank you for being with us. Thank you.